It's Wednesday, January the 16th, 2019. Here at Covenant Keepers Ministries, as we're attempting to encourage you to seek the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, with all your strength, we're, we're doing a study of, of the Ten Commandments. And today we're going to begin with that first one as we've done some little preparatory work the last couple of days. We're reading out of Exodus 23, 20, verse 3. It says this, You shall have no other gods before me. This was a command given by God to the children of Israel. You shall have no other gods before me. This was an extremely important command as the children of Israel had just previously left the land of Egypt where the worship of multitudes of gods was present and they were going to go into the land of Canaan, the promised land, where the natives of that land, all the ites, the, were, were worshiping multiple gods. And he was telling them, I alone am God. I am God. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus states so clearly in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 and 25, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is to be known as money or deceitful riches. The implication here is that money can't be your God. So what that says to me is God saying, I, I want you to know I'm the only God. Monotheistic, monotheism, one God. As opposed to polytheism, which is the worship of a multitude or many gods. And at the cultural time of that day and in the cultural time of our day, this is hugely important because the call to the nation of Israel, as is the call to the follower of Christ today, we're to be worshiping only one God. We're not to pray to, worship, or seek guidance from any other gods, spirits, or dead people. Our consecration and devotion is to God alone. God has revealed himself to us in his word and by his Holy Spirit. And he says, I alone am God, and you shall have no other gods before me. Today, after years of this teaching has permeated the American culture, and I mean for 200 years in American history, our culture has been saturated with monotheistic theology. We have, to a great degree, digressed either into atheism, agnosticism, or an elevation of self to the position of God. Any of these, when closely examined, present utter foolishness on our part. You don't have to look very hard to see that something or someone is behind how all of the earth exists. Unfortunately, this now has created a huge polytheism in America. Anything or anyone has become a god to so many people, including believers who are polytheistic in their behavior, whether they would acknowledge mentally or give intellectual assent to the fact that oh, I really only worship God. Animals, animals have become the focal point of worship for many. It's not a new thing. I mean, it was true in Moses' day. I mean, you don't have to look very far to see the worship of animals in, in the cultures of ancient history. Sports figures musicians, even gospel musicians, actors, actresses, politicians, wealthy folk, people like uh, the owners of Amazon and Buffett and Gates and all these big names. They, I mean, they're the guru, they're the go-to person for so many people, and they really are being worshipped. Men and women swoon at the thought of contact with these gods. I mean, you would think that that musician 
oh my goodness, if you if you watch what's happening and, and some of us have been involved in it, a, a gospel musician is coming to town, it's like we would give uh, anything to be front and center and even have them make eye contact with us. We would swoon at that. But God says, you shall have no other gods before me. I alone am to be worshipped. Giving 93% of our worship to God while holding 7% back to ourselves or someone or something else is still idolatry and the neglect of what is holy. And let's be honest about this. We're easily snared into the worship of others or ourselves. I think there's one sure way to keep God in proper focus. And that is by understanding who he is and what he is like. Who can compare to God? If we're not careful, the lust of our flesh get in the way and we get traveling down the wrong path. But who, come on, who can compare to our God? It would do all of us well to just go back and examine the book of Job, chapters 38 through 41, where the Lord speaks to Job and basically corrects him. And in the study of those chapters, I'm going to give just a couple highlights so you'll, you'll get the sense. You don't get any other gods before me. So Job is asked certain questions by the Lord. And it reveals who he is. And so God questioned Job and he said, uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God asked other questions. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place that you may take it to its territory, that you may know the paths to its home? More questions. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? If you read through those four chapters, 38, 39, 40, and 41 of Job, you will begin to get a grander picture of who God is and why he is so worthy of our worship because he alone is God. He is alive, he's not dead, and he is God. When we are in our right mind, and there is no way, there is no way when we're in our right mind that we will give our worship to any other save Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. But when we are drawn away of our own lust and enticed, we easily give into the flesh and we worship other objects, other people. And there's a, there's a reason for that. In, in the DNA of, of our being created, we are designed for worship. Uh, as free moral agents, we choose who and what we are worshiping. And God has a right to require as our creator undiv undivided worship of himself by the working of his Holy Spirit and our cooperation, that will happen. You shall have no other gods before me. Holy Spirit, we confess we need help with this. There are times in our flesh we go to the adoration, to the adorning of others and other things, and we revere them. May there be a stirring an anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to go after God and hunger and thirst for his righteousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Grace and peace. Be blessed today.